I actually have have an activity. Right. <laughs> so, um, and Meha, if you're around, I'm going to ask you if you could be my chat monitor, um, simply because I'm not very good at multitasking when I'm presenting. Sure. I just can't sure. can't do both. I understand. So, um, I'm going to start by sharing my screen. Well, maybe I'll introduce myself and then I'll share my screen. I'm Rebecca Hogue. Um, I'm going to lead this discussion on uh, podcasts, uh, not podcasts, oh my goodness, on <laughs> creating infographics. I am located in a small town in Nova Scotia, Canada called Bridgewater, Nova Scotia. Um, but I'm an instructor in the instructional design program at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. And uh, infographics, one of the courses that I teach is a course in multimedia. And so one of the things I have my students do is creating infographics. And so it's been an interesting process of, of how to go about creating infographics. And so that's what I'm going to share with you today. Um, and so let me start by sharing my screen. And then I, I do have a um, a chat introduction, but since we're a small group, I think if anybody wants to introduce themselves, the question that I'm asking, sorry, I'm, I'm being waffling here. I said right in the chat, what are your experiences with creating infographics? But if anybody wants to speak to their experiences, um, I welcome that as well. I can speak to it. So I work on our outreach and marketing team at my technical college library. And so we've been getting into creating infographics as a way to convey a lot of complex statistics and information. Um, but I'd really like to get more proficient at it, which is why I'm really excited for this workshop. Cool. Thank you, Rachel. So there is in the chat, um... Someone was talking about Sue, who says she tries to make math more visual and her presentations and trying to do some presentations about using speech recognition. And I'm talking about how frustrated I am with people who make bad infographics, you know that. <laughs> um, and someone who says they have zero experience, that's Claudia or Claudia. Um, and Kate Malloy is saying on her commute home, so okay. Most people are saying they have very little or zero experience. Alia remembers creating an infographic with her group mates before using Canva. That was a while yeah. ago and she needs refreshments. And Thea doesn't have any experience creating infographics, but she does create technical drawings, scientific tables and charts. And she's used Canva too. But you can do lots of mm -hmm. things with Canva that aren't infographics, I'm guessing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You can do video with Can Canva now. Canva has become this crazy tool for um, a whole lot of, especially marketing and social media stuff because they've got a lot of templates that are just the right size for things. Um, okay, so why don't we start with, I'm gonna share my screen. I'm gonna talk a little bit, but do interrupt with questions. Do um, ask questions in the chat. Uh, don't do that. Um, I hit the end meeting. I'm like, <laughs> that's not what I wanna do. Okay. This goes over here, this goes over here, so I can move things on my screen. Um, and I'm gonna slide show this just so it's 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 sort of bigger. So I got a sense of what you're going, doing. Um, so what is an infographic is sort of the, the question. And the idea is an infographic is a visual representation of information. And I use infographics a fair bit to supplement, especially I use them as job aids is, is what I would call them for my students. So anything I think my students might find useful if they printed it and put it up on their wall, <laughs> right? So processes, right? So a lot of, I, I share a lot of, how do you go about doing things, processes, that kind of thing in infographics. Um, and other people use data for infographics, but what the key is, is sort of determining, you know, how do you do it? And so I have created an infographic, which I will share. I shared with people who, um, were registered earlier, but I'll share it again after the session of an infographic on how to create infographics. <laughs> and so I've sort of defined these eight steps that I go through when I'm creating infographics. And what's particularly interesting is that um, 
it aligns largely with um, instructional design where you always start with the goal in mind because yes, the slides will be available later. Um, start with a goal in mind. It is too often that you think, oh, I'm gonna make an infographic and you jump into the tool and try and design something and then you just fall apart and it doesn't work. Um, and that's largely because you haven't asked that question first. And so the first thing I do when I create an infographic is I'll say, what is the purpose? Why am I creating an infographic? And so in this case, I'm creating an infographic about how to create infographics. So the graphics is going to go over the main steps um, of how I do this. Um, and then I want to determine the messaging. So um, Rachel mentioned marketing and infographics. Often there is a very large tie to marketing that is sort of. And so determining exactly what it is you're trying, you want people to remember out of it. Um, and so for me, sort of the key message is that you can't just jump in front of a computer and magically create an infographic with a tool. Um, you have to know what information you want to communicate. You need to know, you need to collect that information and have it ready for you before you jump into the creative process. Because if you're trying to create and you don't know your message, you're just going to end up with this confusing mumble of stuff. And so getting straight, getting to the message. Um, and so I was going to do this as a breakout activity, but I don't know if we've got enough people here for that. Um, but what, what type of infographic are you trying to create? That's my sort of question. And I'm going to break out of this and stop sharing my screen. Um, I think I just hit the wrong button. There it is. Oh, we have 10 people not counting you. Okay, we could break into we could break into um, a couple of groups and people can have a, a, a short conversation, maybe about seven minutes on what it is you want to create your infographic on. What is your message? Can you refine? Can you figure out how to refine your message? Um, and then when we come back, if people want to share their their key message for their infographic, um, that would be good. So let's try that. So with that, I'm going to, where's the breakout rooms? My screen bigger. There they are. Um, and it's going to be random. And I'm going to move this person over to there we go. Okay. Um, and we will come back in about eight minutes. Any questions before we go? No. Okay. Give this thing a try.
Um, I didn't didn't quite finish the sentence <laughs> when I popped out. Um, but yeah, we'll get to that later about the different tools for creating infographics because there's a lot out there. Um, does anybody want to share any insights around um, sort of getting behind the message and figuring out? So I kind of want to do something a little bit different. So I work with students in technology and my like overall message that I'd like to convey as um, to be a successful student, you need to um, be proficient in these tools or have access to them is kind of the general message. And then I have um, specific tools that I'd like to include in that infographic. Um, just instead of like a list of links, I think that might that might convey the whole message of to be successful, you need to do these things, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. Oh, that makes complete sense. Thank you. That's that's a great example. Anyone else? So my group and I were thinking about classroom rules, um, uh, creating an infographic based on that. Uh, for instance, be kind. And then Rebecca uh, added um, a lovely input there by saying, for instance, we can support that with a visual, such as you know, two people shaking hands, for instance, just to you know reinforce the be kind one. Uh, we agreed that it's better not to negate things. So instead of uh, no bullying is allowed, a be kind would be a good replacement here. Uh, respect each other, you know, a whole list of rules that would promote a, a healthy school atmosphere or environment in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing that you just said that I think, I, again, I trigger on a healthy environment, right? That's the message that you're trying to get across. It's not not necessarily the words that, that you're going to say. Yes. And the syllabus infographic, yes. I actually have done that um, for some of my courses. I do a one page, um, one page syllabus or something, because that's something that students can then, again, I think about it as a job aid, right? Can I print it out? Um, is it on either A4 or a letter, right? Whatever your standard print page is so that they can print it and put it on the wall, right? <laughs> that makes it useful, um, but not too much text. And that's the part that we're gonna get to sort of next. Um, I let, I'm just checking in here. I like, I like, uh, Christy says, I like the idea of an infographic for my syllabus. I also think about the student assignment where they make an infographic summarizing various psychological disorders. Yeah, I also have my students, because I do, because my students are doing design work, one of the projects I have them to do is their proposal of what their project is going to be. And I have them do that in an infographic because again, it gets down to the, it, it helps get to the heart of what is the message you're trying to send as opposed to picking the different things. So next I'm going to jump into, let's go back to my slides. Becky, there's a question in the chat about whether we're going to oh. get to the question of how to make them accessible. Is that coming up at some point? It indeed it is. It is. Um, we'll talk about accessibility quite soon, actually. Um, and it, it's interesting because it, it was a question that I was I've been thinking a lot about because it's like we're creating a visual. <laughs> oh, wrong button. Sorry. Uh, do that all the time. We're creating a visual thing that's intentionally visual. Um, the next step in the process is to collect all your data. Um, so you figured out your message, now you need to collect all of your data. And in collecting your data, this is where if you've got a list of tools that you want, right? You wanna, you wanna put all that information somewhere. You want a list of, um, or the list of rules, right? those are two examples that we've come up with, then you want to actually write down the specific list of things that you want to have in the document. And so in this case, this is where I, I step up to, well, what's my process? And so I wrote it out in as much, a lot of words, 
right? And you can see there's a lot more words here than actually show up in the final infographic. But I actually wrote, wrote out the process of what I wanted. And so that was my data. This is the data that I'm com communicating in this case. Um, the step I have after this is an interesting one. And I think that, it, that it's effective to write your first draft of your accessibility description, right? So before I even start designing, I want to write out in my mind, what is the message that this is communicating? Because from a, from, you know, if you think of a blind person, like the, the accessibility thing is about ensuring that everybody gets the same information. It's not about everybody getting the same information in the same way. And so here the focus is on how do I explain what it is I'm trying to communicate? And afterwards I'll go back and update it because I find that, that design is an iterative process, right? So I go through this process and then I realize, oh, I got too much of this or too much of that. And then I have to go through it again. So if you can see my accessibility, right? I start off with um, the infographic, because I tell them it's an infographic up front, shows a process for creating an infographic. It was designed by me, that's just the footer information, right? And has a CC by NC license. It outlines eight steps. So you can see the numbers that are on it, creating the infographic, and then specifically what the steps are. Um, that's how I describe my infographic in my alt text. Um, but you can see that it changed a bit from when I first described it, but this is how I first described it. And I think doing this activity of writing the accessibility description before actually designing it kind of helps with focusing, Help, helps to focus what it is you're trying to communicate um, and what that message is. Because then now you can tell somebody what that message is. Does anybody have questions on that? Does that make sense? <laughs> I can't. I can't see the chat when I'm sharing my screen. It disappeared on me. So correct me if I'm wrong. Basically, the before and after. What you're doing is you're removing um, first party sort of. Um, um, language and making it more generic so that it's um, it, it becomes a more generic way of describing things. Is that is that what you did there? That's part of what I did. Um, yeah, so you can see that things are much more concise, right? So some of it is that's part of how I made it more concise. Um, I also simplified a few things like so explore uh, explore design ideas. For example, ah, sorry, it keeps changing screens on me, um, became explore designs. Explore color schemes actually became choose colors because it's not quite the same thing. Thing is, yeah, you have to choose a color scheme actually. Um, some, of, some of what happens is you, uh, you write something and then you go back and you change it um, after you've finished it because Design is an iterative process. And so once you start playing with images and imagery, you may want to change some of the words. But the idea here is to get as few words as possible and still communicate the same message. Because because infographics shouldn't be text heavy. All right, that's one of the goals is to try and replace the text. But on the other hand, for the accessible person in particular, you need to use text to explain it. So you still have to be able to explain it in text. That's a great tip on color. We'll get there <laughs> um, on, on color schemes and stuff like that. And I'm going to ask people for your tips on this. Does anybody have tips for writing good, concise descriptions? Revise, revise, revise. Indeed, yeah, I, I would every 
one of the tricks they teach you in in basic journalism courses and stuff is you write it write your first draft don't think about it when you're writing your just get the information out there and then cut it by 50 percent and then cut it by 50 percent again <laughs> and you just each revision what is the core get down to the 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 specific thing um, data collection. Um, Danielle says, um, regarding data collection, based on experiences and things I've read, you might use about one third of the data you've collected by the time you finish the educational thing you're designing. So I hope people don't feel discouraged if they end up having to cut away too much material. Yeah, if there's too much information, what happens is um, what we call cognitive overload right? And the reader then just loses it. <laughs> um, I like to say, you know, one of, the, one of the books I recommend, and I'll get to that a little bit later when we're actually dealing with the design, is called White Space is Not Your Enemy. Um, and that's actually an important concept when you're designing this too. If it's too cluttered, you're going to lose your audience. And so trying to keep things um, simple. Becky, I have too. a question because you made a decision um, to do it as write description rather than write your accessibility description. Whereas your title for the slide, accessibility description, actually I think sounds better than write description. Because when, when I read it and it said write description, it doesn't, uh, it, it means something different than the accessibility description, even though it's actually the same thing, but it mm -hmm. communicates to us that our question about is accessibility is gonna be covered today, you know? And like so recognizing that it's there for accessibility rather than just for the heck of it. Yeah, I'm going to jump back and look at my image. What is my image? I was choosing between two different images, and I think the other image would have communicated that better. Mm. I had another icon that had like an ear with the ear crossed out. Oh. that very, very clearly communicated accessibility. And mm -hmm. I chose, the, I clearly didn't choose the one that I needed to make that. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Yeah. That's really interesting one when it comes to choosing images and icons, whether the icon reinforces the message or adds to the message. Cause that, what you just described there would have added an, another angle to, to what's written rather than just confirming it. Yeah. Um, but, I want to leave the word in there because um, I want each one to be able to kind of stand on its own. I mean, if I can't see the icon, then I'm not going to know, I'm not going to have that input. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's one word and it's a, and I, it's one word and it's an important word. It's an important word. Yeah. I'm yeah. trying to figure out how can I do that in two words? I'm only because of the aesthetic of the thing. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you just want two words for each. Huh? Breaks. Yeah, breaks Rachel the has, Rachel has good advice, though. Like, have someone else read what you've written and see how they understand it and then revise based on that. Absolutely. Absolutely. The, um, yeah, you guys are giving me great ideas. But that yeah, that is a particularly important one. And I, I think uh, accessibility so yeah, so I see write description here, but then the next thing I have is accessibility description, which is really what, what my idea was beforehand. Um, but I, I want to outline that part of the important part of this is to do this, or at least do the first draft of it before you get to your visual. So don't make it an afterthought is sort of is, is what I was getting at. But that's really... Um, yeah, you've got me thinking now how I can change that. I think what you were trying to do, like my guess here, is like you wanted everyone to start with a verb. An yeah. accessibility description isn't a verb, but yep. maybe write accessibly or, but that would imply something else as well. It, mean, it sounds like right. writing yeah. simple language rather than for visual accessibility. How about write mm -hmm. for accessibility? So that's an extra word there. But it's so a small go, word. Yeah, it's a small right. word. Right. And it and it makes the two words you know right for accessibility, uh, but it but it's still I don't know the accessible descript accessibility description is what it is, like it's really a two word phrase that's one thing. Oh, compose, Rachel has a good one. Compose alt compose text. alt text. I like that. I like that too. Yeah, because that's technically what you're doing. 
Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And yes, someone who doesn't know what alt text is won't understand, but they will eventually the infographic is right. going to be well, the infographic. With... Yeah, it's it is supported with what's behind it. Right. So in yeah. some ways, yeah, it doesn't completely stand alone. It needs the lesson behind it. But when you see the lesson, when you see the infographic later, after having had the exactly. lesson, it will recall It'll allow you to recall everyone, but I really like that compose alt text. Definitely going to fix that. <laughs> That's a great. And I'm going to change the icon because I think I got a better icon for that too. Um, I had a little activity here um, based upon an infographic that I created way back when um, and wanted to, to see if you were interested in trying to um, write it, draw it based upon the description. So if you had a piece of paper or something, can you draw what this infographic says based upon this description? Um, which is the infographic shows a mnemonic for writing learning objectives. Um, it's titled how to write learning objectives, A, B, C, D. And it was designed by me, um, has a CC BY license. Um, with a website link to an old version of my website, because <laughs> it's, it's an old thing. Um, and it shows the letters A, B, C, D, E. And it shows that A stands for audience and who asks who will be doing the behavior. B stands for behavior and asks what should the learner be able to do. C stands for conditions and asks under what conditions do you want the learner to be able to do it. And D stands for degree and ask the question, how oh, well must it be done? And E stands for example, um, with the example instructional design students will be able to write learning objectives with the aid of this document 100% of the time. <laughs> Which is kind of thing. And so I'm wondering if anybody um, wanted to try drawing that and sharing their drawing. I'm gonna ask that question before. I'm gonna stop this share and I'll, I will share with you what I oh, wow. the info graphic actually looks like. I, I do oh. want to find this um, this thing that came up in the daily creates that where you start drawing on the computer and then it creates an icon for you. Does anyone remember what it's called? I'm going to. Oh, my goodness. I'd love that. Yeah, I'll find it. I'll just mute myself and find it because I'm struggling to draw behavior. So I'm stuck anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a video yesterday of a guy because we were thinking of um, having people make avatars of themselves for one of our sessions. Um, and then so how would you take a pic and it kind of showed his drawing process for taking a picture and just like, you know, figuring out with the accent and it was kind of cool. Could you share that text again? Because I couldn't yeah. memorize. Of course, yeah, I realize I'm not sharing my screen so you can't actually see the text. That's foolish of me. Um, now I gotta find the right page again. Uh, it moved. Sorry. <laughs> I know what happened. I know what happened. I will share the text again once I find it. That one, that's why. Uh, your screen. There we go. And I'll also put it in the chat. Thanks. I'm looking sideways, it's because I have two screens. <laughs> and that's where, I, where uh, Zoom has put the pictures of people. So I am actually looking at people, it's just that.
it's interesting what people are are commenting on or seeing is is the visualization of the different things. Um, although, if you read the description, it doesn't say that I actually provided icons for anything. And this is actually an interesting thing is that you don't necessarily describe all of the aspects in your alt text because you wanna just communicate the message. Does anybody have any insights they wanna share or want to do anything with this anymore with this activity. I don't want to hold. I do find this format really hard to uh, teach him because I can't see people and I'm not used to that. I have a question for you. So are you saying, so this, because I, like you're saying, you're making an observation that we're all trying to think about icons or images, whereas we mm -hmm. could do a graphic representation of this that doesn't have images, but it's just the way we're doing it. Is that what you're saying as well? Mm -hmm. Like doing yeah. something like doing something like the audience in the center as the people and then the behavior is outside of it and then the conditions are outside of it and the degree is just uh, like it could be something like that rather than images for each of the letters. Yeah, you can use text in interesting ways. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, so I'll show you what I actually created because um, it doesn't actually have any images in it. Um, it is, it is but, it, but it does use the text in interesting ways. And it, it just causes the students to, to get, you know, A stands for this, B stands for this. It's a mnemonic, right? Um, and so, yeah, what do you think of that? And the, the question actually came up at one point, is, is that a, an infographic? I think so. But it isn't just text. It's using text and basic images in certain mm -hmm. images like circles and squares even. And in color and layout. And yeah, all of those yeah. other design aspects of things. Um, and so one of the things I want to highlight is that it doesn't have to be overly cluttered. <laughs> it doesn't have to have, um, it, it's about keeping things simple, if you can, or figuring out how, just, just like the first time you write out your text, it's going to be like really wordy and you have to pull out all of the words. It's the same thing for the visuals, right? <laughs> When I collect visuals, I collect like four or five of them. And then I, I have to pick which one sort of works. Okay, let's jump on to um, explore designs. And so this is where uh, I keep hitting the wrong buttons. I'm not very sure. Um, slideshow, okay, explore designs. And so there are lots of tools out there um, where infographics have been designed um, and they provide great templates and they provide horrible templates, I will tell you. <laughs> um, I have a couple of books that I highly recommend if you have not done any work on design before. So if design is a new thing for you, um, I highly recommend White Space is Not Your Enemy. You see that I will quote that somewhere regularly and say, White Space is Not Your Enemy. Interestingly enough, this book is available in my university's library. So check your library before you buy it. Um, I, the older version is available in my library. So I tell my students they don't have to buy it if they don't want it. But honestly, it's such a good book that it's, it is worth buying um, and having the color images and whatever, because it covers a lot of the basic theory, but it is really easy to read, um, which is, I really like. I'm not a graphic artist. Um, I don't need to be a graphic artist, but I do need to be better than the average person with graphics. And that's sort of the balancing point where I look at things like this. 
the other one that's that has a huge impact is the non-designers design book. Just now, the non-designers web book is not very good, but the non-designers design book by Robin Williams, um, female Robin Williams, by the way, totally different person, um, is a really, really good book. And it just highlights things like avoid centering text. <laughs> You know, like that kind of thing. Um, there, there's some really interesting principles in there that you can follow and it will make your designs look a lot better. Alignment. Um, so there are tools out there. Some of them, I, I pick Canva is one that a lot of people look at. Um, PictoChart, um, Vengage and VizMe are a couple of others. And I'm gonna share the links in the chat. Um, and what I do is I actually go to these places and, oh, okay, where did that go? Um, I go to these places and I look at them for ideas, but I don't actually build any of my um, infographics in these tools. Um, I use the, uh, the I actually build all of my infographics in either PowerPoint or, um, Illustrator, Adobe Illustrator, um, because I find that the tools can be very um, I don't know. I find them more challenging to to edit they're things the way I want them. Yeah, they're but more yeah, restrictive. They force you to follow the templates in ways that I don't necessarily want to follow the templates. Um, and again, I use a lot of white space, so. Microsoft Word does a great job. Um, but I'm gonna suggest that we all go and take a look at a couple of these um, tools to see what different types of templates are available and what resonates and what doesn't resonate. Cause I actually found like when I went to Canva, that one, I actually have a, I can log into that one. Um, I think I'm, I'm in with Google and Canva. Sorry, I was trying to remember how I log in. That'll do. Uh, um, and you just type in infographic. Infographic templates. Um, and there's some interesting ideas of, you know, things like you can put numbers on opposite sides with images and that kind of stuff. But I find a lot of their examples are cluttered. They got too much information and, and too much clutter in the background. Like this one here, it's like this whole thing, why would you put that background in? If you take the background out, then the whole thing actually looks less cluttered. Just say it. But I look at these things and get ideas from them. And so my thought is, is that like, yeah, these were created by professional designers, um, but they can be very difficult to, um, mimic. They can be very difficult to change, to make it work with what you're trying, the message you're trying to communicate in the color scheme that you're trying to use. So, um, however, some people love creating in Canva. <laughs> and so I don't wanna, um, and that's true for, I actually sometimes use PowerPoint. I'll sometimes go into PowerPoint and write my list out and have it generate things and see what comes of it. Cause I find sometimes that's really useful um, in the process. Um, but the idea here is, is really just to get ideas. What are the design ideas? What are the thoughts um, behind it? I'm gonna jump through a few more things before we, cause I wanna make sure I share a few things and then we'll go through questions and jump thing. Uh, I wanna take a look also, is there any um, comments? Oh, great comment about neurodiverse students um, and again, coming back into the complexity of some of the things, like keeping it simple is actually more effective um, because it, it 
actually reduces the, the clutter that gets in the way of communicating the message, um, which is often what the biggest challenge is with infographics. But we're actually not trying to market something pretty. We're trying to educate about something, right? So because our goal is actually, you know, educating, not just drawing attention. Like in marketing, it's often just getting the attention of the person, but here we're actually trying to communicate a key message. And so, but speaking of marketing, colors, choosing colors. And I did see somebody had a really important message about colors, about pick one color and then use two shades of gray. That's actually a really great tip because that is you're more likely to have accessible colors that way. The biggest challenge I find with all, and, and Canva's guilty of it quite regularly is, as are some of the other templates, is contrast. Um, make sure that when you're using colors that you're not violating the contrast rules. <laughs> um, and what I mean by that is, is all of your images have to have adequate contrast. Um, if somebody is colorblind, yeah, there's some neat colorblindness simula simulator tools out there. There's also a simple thing by um, this guy here, um, Wave. I think it. I think that's the one where it's it. It actually pulls out a bunch of the sorry accessibility aspects, but it'll tell you if your colors. Um, your contrast is the problem. There's another one that's that's easier for contrast. I don't seem to have it up here right now. The um, web aim color contrast checker is really good. Yeah, and Thea just put it in the chat. <laughs> yeah. And you can, yeah, update yeah. things, but the key is make sure that you have adequate contrast and you can actually see it or you should be able to see it. Like it, 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 once you're used to doing it, okay, how do I get this thing to turn off now? Let me just hit this again. Yes, okay. Um, once you get used to doing it, it becomes a lot easier to, you know, tell right away. Like I can usually tell, now maybe it's because I have visual issues, but I can tell when people have contrast problems right away with my students. I'm like, uh, yeah, that's gonna flag. If you use, Blackboard Ally, it will tell you as well. That is actually one of the big things Blackboard Ally will pick out if that's what you're using is contrast. Um, and so that's, um, it's also built into PowerPoint. PowerPoint has an accessibility checker right in it now, which is really handy. And so you can just do a quick, and that's actually great when you're using PowerPoint to actually create your infographic because then you can actually validate it right in the same tool to make sure that you have had a quick color. Um, for creating color palettes, I use Adobe Color. Um, the color palette that I'm using, you can see I've got a bunch of my fest ones in my library. Um, I actually uploaded the MyFest logo and then had it pick colors based upon the logo. And so I find that that's actually, you know, being able to extract a theme based upon an image is super handy. And then you can then do whatever until you find something that you like. I am not great on colors otherwise. And so I don't pick and don't use too many colors. <laughs> just don't use too many colors. It gives you five. You shouldn't need five colors. <laughs> um, just saying like, yeah, again, the less, less is more in this context. Um, but Adobe Color is a great, it's a free tool. It's a great tool for creating color schemes. If you are working within an organization, your color schemes may de be defined for you. Um, and so marketing is your friend. Marketing um, can give you your color schemes. You, um, your website, actually, usually your organizational website, like I can type in uh, umb.edu and logo or whatever, and it brings me to the marketing page that has all of the branding information I need in order to brand appropriately. And so you'll note that if you look at the, the MyFest colors um, and then you go back to my logo here, right? This matches the color scheme 
um, because I use the MyFest colors as my choice for color scheme for this presentation. I have color schemes for my textbooks as well. So when I um, create OER textbooks, one of the things that I create with it is the color scheme so that I'm using a consistent color scheme in everything that I do. Um, and then collecting images. And this is an interesting thing too. Again, if you're using tools like Canva, it comes with some images, but often they're not the images that you want. Um, so one of the places that I think is like probably the best place to collect images is the Noun Project. If you've not heard of the Noun Project, the Noun Project as, a, as an instructor or as an educator, I think it cost me $25 a year to get the non-branded um, version of icons. And it is literally icons for everything. So if we wanted accessible, you can tell it was one of the words that I searched for in the past. <laughs> Right, I can see all of these different icons. I can choose which one I want. And, you know, there are literally hundreds of them um, on pretty much anything. Um, and I can change the color. I can make the color of the icon any color I want. And so I find, I find it, it, you know, it's a great little tool. Um, with the SVG, you probably can even edit the icons more. Um, and worth every penny of it. So that that is one that I use quite frequently. If I want to make things look a little more colorful, um, I use presenter media, um, but I pay for presenter media. Um, so that is something I use quite frequently as well. Um, and then there's there's uh, wiki comments, right? You can grab images from icons and images from anywhere. Um, so one of the things that I do, um, I you typically use the noun project. And when I was creating this presentation, I picked three or four icons for each item so that when I was putting it together, I could figure out which ones actually looked right and looked good together. One of the things to be aware of um, is the very different styles of icons. And so you can see that I tried to get the same kind of style. Number seven, I love the icon. Um, it doesn't fit the same style as the others. You can see it uses thinner lines. And so it's not quite the same. I try as much as I can to get the same look in the icons. That I'm using. Do you know something that helps with that? Um, Google Slides has an add-on called Icons for Slides, which I think gets vector graphics from, I can't remember the site, but anyway, if you have that installed in your Google Slides, when you pick an icon, you can then later choose to search icons in the same style. Mm, so it ends up that useful. all your icons are the same style. It's really cool that way. Google Slides does that. Okay, I'm going to have uh, to take a look. Add -on. It's yeah. an add-on. It's an add-on. I'll get you. I know I can, yeah, because I know I can do the add on with the noun project in PowerPoint. PowerPoint has a way to, to use all of the noun project icons. You are. Sorry, Roz, I don't know the question. Context. She means URL, I think. Oh. URL stems. Uh, uh, what's the URL for which? So oh, yeah, URL. Connect. I was asking Maha. She said she had something. Uh, Sorry. I'm getting it. Oh, okay. Thanks. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I was like, huh? Um, yeah. And then the last step I have is building the infographic. And um, I usually use PowerPoint. Uh, almost always, actually, unless I want to when I create an infographic for my courses, because I a lot of my courses I use um, some kind of framework for my course, um, some sort of conceptual framework. And when I create the conceptual framework, I sometimes want to be able to say, this is for this part of the course. And so in order to pull those things out, I often need to use um, Illustrator in order to create 
um, in order to pull out the individual aspects um, because PowerPoint is great at just um, creating the whole slide as a JPEG, but it's not very good at doing the individual layers. Icons for slides, is that a paid add-on? No, it's free. Huh, cool. Uh, it's free up to a point. I think if you use more than, I don't know, 20 in one day, it'll stop. And then the next day you can go and add some more. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, one, I think what? 20 a day is plenty. <laughs> I mean, it depends if your job is. It really depends graphics. on what you're doing. Yeah, <laughs> it really, really depends on what you're doing. If you're doing quite, I tend to get into design mode, so I'm creating several of them. And so, yeah, you can uh, run into that problem. Um, and then the other, the only other thing comment I was going to make is don't forget to cite your sources. Um, if you and cite anything, like if you're using any graphics that are CC BY or anything like that, you need to cite them as well. Um, I don't have any citations in most of mine because I'm pulling the information out of my head <laughs> and making it up as I go. Um, so, and all of the graphics, although they came from the noun project because I pay for it, I don't have to actually specify that. Um, I have a right to use without doing that. Any questions? Yes, GIMP is a free open source tool, has layers. I think though that GIMP is, GIMP is not the vector one. Uh, I think GIMP is the equivalent of Photoshop. Um, there's another one. Ink something, Inkscape maybe, Inkscape that, yeah, so <laughs> Inkscape yeah. is the one that does vectors. Yeah. Um, the difference is really um, important. Of, yeah, it is important. A, vectors, a, a vector describes the image in the code as opposed to a bitmap, which describes each bit. But um, as so a vector is vector, right? Yes. Okay, you can in GIMP you can export as SVG. You can export as SVG. Is SVG actually vector? Yes, it is vector. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Because especially when I'm doing icons, you yeah, know, that's plenty. You know, you need yeah. The reason you want vector images is so that they resize without going right. blurry. Right. You can have an infinite, you can make them bigger or smaller and they won't go blurry, they'll stay crisp. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what the key reason you want to use a vector image. So now I even find the icons in this graphic are not as clear as they could be. And that's because I've exported it. The original is a lot clearer, but because I exported it as, as a JPEG to put it in the slide here, it loses its crispness because it's meant to be a certain size and the minute you change the size that happens. One of the things for accessibility again that I try to do where possible is if you're creating it not on Google Slides but if you're creating it on one of those other tools to download it as a PDF that's screen readable because mm -hmm. a lot of times people download the image as an image of the infographic as a whole not for the icons but the entire infographic. Yeah, right. the PD, the PDF as getting accessible PDFs can be a challenge. A lot of things will generate PDF. A lot of the tools will generate PDFs, but they're not accessible or readable. Okay, so when you create it on Google Slides, that's a guarantee that it's going to be accessible because you're just typing text, right? Mm -hmm. Or that alt text that we wrote, I guess. The alt text, yeah. Because um, like in PowerPoint, one of the challenges is, um, actually, no, I think PowerPoint does let you mark, mark things as decorative. There's one of the tools that doesn't let you do that. 
which is super frustrating because if it's decorative, you don't need to have a description and you shouldn't have a description. And not all of the tools will let you not do that or they'll flag it if you don't have a description when you're not supposed to have a description, which I find anytime anything is automated, the risk that there are challenges with getting it right. So Rebecca, I just have a quick question. If we create the infographic and then we download it as an image and upload it on Google Slides or PowerPoint, how can we ensure that it's entirely accessible to, for example, for the visually impaired, for instance? If PDF is not an accessible version, and I heard that Google Slides is not always accessible either, how can we guarantee? Um, hmm. The key is that you've written the alt text behind it. So when I put this in here, right, one of the, okay, it keeps clicking on me. As an image, right? You, 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 it comes in as an, an image, and then there's alt text behind it, which I <laughs> clearly have not put in. <laughs> um, but I should have the, the full description in the alt text. This should be the creating infographics, infographic. And I have my description, I've written it. So why would I not put it in here? I just have to hit okay, get down to where I put it. And does it read it, <laughs> does the screen reader read it in order? Cause I heard like, for example, in some PowerPoint slides when I was uh, working on uh, that for accessibility purposes, uh, the screen reader doesn't necessarily read things in the order you put them. Okay, the yeah, so I will show you that. Because I do that, I'm going to stop sharing this and I'll open it up in PowerPoint. I'll open up my source um, because I think that that's interesting and is something that I did do. Um, so let me just find it now. It's... Uh, too many windows. My fast infographic. Okay. Now I've lost my Zoom. <laughs> Zoom window. If we Zoom talk, window. will it help? <laughs> <laughs> like, oh no, where did it go? Are you on okay. a Mac? If you're just on a Windows machine, do Alt Tab. Yeah, I found it. Windows I now. found it. I don't know why it's doing this. You can see the presentation here, but you can't see it in here. It's not showing properly. Oh, there we go. Maybe it just didn't shrink down to size. Um, when you do the the um, Okay, where is that hidden? I have two, this is the problem, my tools are in two places. Um, the accessibility check. Um, I'm missing some alt text somewhere. Oh, there's a rectangle. And check order. It always tells you to check the order and then it tells you how to do it. So home, arrange, and then selection pane. So home, uh, range is over here. Hide her for a second here. Arrange selection pane, and then here you actually literally tell it what order the screen reader is going to read things in. So I actually went and reorganized everything by group so that this one goes here. So it'll say that, and then it'll do this number one, and then it'll say the picture. Actually, it won't say the picture usually. Um, if I do that, it makes it go away, but. Um, that's marked as decorative, so it won't read it. And then it'll go to the rounded triangle, and then it'll go to the text box and read the text. How do you so mark any, it as decorative? For um, you, yeah, so that's in um, that's that's in the alt text. That's when you edit created alt text. Yeah, edit alt text. There's a button. Ah, mark as decorative. I see. Okay. Mark as decorative, so you can mark it as decorative, so it won't won't get read. Google Slides doesn't have that. Yeah, so that's basically just on the regular PowerPoint slides, not yep. on Google. 
Mm. Yeah. So I could give this to, this would be the version that makes more sense to give to the student rather than the PDF of this. Although I don't know, because if I go to the PDF in, so here's the other interesting thing in Office 360, if you generate your PDF from your desktop app, it's not, not accessible, but if you generate it from the web, it is. <laughs> um, I found that with, um, Microsoft Word anyways. So anytime I create my syllabus, I create it nicely on my desktop, looks great. Then I have to go log into Office 360 Drive and then download the PDF from there in order to get an accessible PDF. Um, from Drive, so not from your desktop. What difference does not, that make? Is it the same format? <laughs> um, it uses a different engine to create the PDF. And the oh. engine, at least on the Mac, the engine that's on my, my device is not creating properly accessible things, but the one on the web does. Okay, so basically what we can do is we can create an infographic on Google Slides, for instance, and then download it as a PowerPoint, a regular PowerPoint. Or if you're working on, for instance, um, uh, uh, Google Docs, then you can then download it as a regular a Word document instead of you know uploading it to the desktop uh, to the drive and then downloading it from there. We can just start off with the drive. I think she's I think she's talking about OneDrive, which is a Microsoft three six five tool, Alia. So it's not Google Drive, it's Microsoft it's OneDrive. I mean, Microsoft OneDrive. Yeah, mm -hmm. but isn't it the it's same different. one? No. When we so so if you like create a Word document on your desktop. Aside of OneDrive, just in general, if you create a PowerPoint, a regular PowerPoint on your desktop, uh, yeah. will it be as accessible as creating a Google Slides and downloading it as a PowerPoint, a regular PowerPoint? It's the same thing? No, I don't think so, because I don't know how much, how well Google talks to PowerPoint. My question is, why would you it's do that? It's not horrible because sometimes you want to create it uh, in collaboration with other people. Mm, okay. And it's 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 generally nicer, but then PowerPoint is more accessible, I think, in general. I've heard that from Yeah, NASA. that was going to be my question. I mean, the whole purpose of Google Slides is to um, allow for online collaboration in real time, and it's WYSIWYG, but you know, how do you, how do you handle the accessibility if you so need OneDrive to is the same, right? OneDrive is, uh, is allow, allows collaboration on WYSIWYG as well. Not it's not WYSIWYG as good. It, it, the issue with OneDrive and collaboration is that it's delayed. And so, cause I tried using it with my students yes. and it's a nightmare because it no, does not it, refresh in real it's time. It's not WYSIWYG, it's not WYSIWYG. It has a cycle of um, um, saving, you know, like every how many seconds or how many minutes. And if some participants are behind a firewall because they're in certain countries, it's not WYSIWYG at all. Yeah, it's also, a, yeah, it is a paid app. It's a, 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 yeah. It is an expensive option. If um, if your university doesn't provide it, so you know what, my Alia, university provides out, it. Alia, we should check out what happens to Google Slides and download to PowerPoint. I remember years ago, like five years ago, if you downloaded slides to PowerPoint, the the formatting got messed up. That still happens. Not so with, bad anymore. Not so bad anymore. It's good to hear. No, but, but my only thing is that accessibility because SharePoint and, and OneDrive, they're, they're not WYSIWYG. It, you can't really do that kind of real-time collaboration. So I'm just curious, Rebecca, if in your experience using Google Drive, something that's live in the cloud, that's not accessible, you're saying? It doesn't have that accessibility um, alt text? It does have alt text, Google, Google, Google Drive does, it just does it differently. Like, so they, these are all in Google Drive, right? Um, you're not seeing it anymore. No, right now, right now I see PowerPoint. Yeah, so the, my slot, <clears throat> my slides I found though were, an accessibility, sorry to interrupt. I found an accessibility checker add-on for Google Slides. Oh, Maybe okay. that would do what 
happens with PowerPoint. I mean, what I liked with the PowerPoint is not the alt text is available on Google Slides, but I like that it checks for you. So mm -hmm. it would be nice if Google Slides. Well, and it. does Google Slides do the order thing? Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna download this accessibility checker mm -hmm. from the Google Workspace. Um, does the order the order in which information is read on the screen is important when there are objects on the screen? Makes sense. And I'm not sure if and I'm not sure how I would do that in Google Slides. So it was a range. Um, a range. Order. Look at that. I flip two things. I can go arrange. Oh, no, it won't. Let me order. I don't have very many things on any of my slides. <laughs> What's that, the accessibility plugin? Do you want to? Yeah, I'm going to put it in the chat. I chat. haven't used it though. I just discovered it right now. Mm -hmm. um, try. Add on, there it is. <laughs> I mean, the kinds of things they say are a little bit funny. Oh, okay, so there are some images, for example, here that don't have alt. It, it checks, it says slides have a language, slides have a title, high contrast text, charts have alt text, images have alt text, and other checks. And it gives you like a smiley face or a brownie face. Oh, screen reader report, support. Didn't realize I had to turn that on. Oh, that's cool. Where's that? Where'd you get that? That was under uh, tools, accessibility right. settings. Right, that's cool. Right, oh, there wow. it is, um, um, voice to speaker notes. It's great. So, oh, I have to click to speak now. There's a way when I'm presenting for it to actually do live transcription. That was built in. But where, okay, I installed that thing, but I can't figure out where I access it from. Uh, Add-ons. Yeah, it's interesting. It's not showing up. I got at oh. it, so I've got to manage them. It says it's installed. It looks like it's installed. It is installed. So you don't, you don't Where see is under it? the add-ons? No, close this. Mm -hmm. And then inside your slides, you see add-ons? Uh, next to tools, yeah. there's add-ons, yeah. Oh, there it is. Checker for some. I get but help. For some reason, I'm not getting that. I don't know why that's happening for you. It's working for me. Maybe it's just taking a minute. You should get a check accessibility option. Yeah. Try again. You try reloading. Oh, maybe. Check. Yeah, there it is. Images of alt text, yes, as we discovered. I have images without alt text and I'm betting it's things like this one. But is it not actually telling me which images? Oh, that's annoying. <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> that's not helpful. Like if you that's have not nine helpful images at all. and only one yeah. doesn't, it's not telling you which one doesn't? Yeah, I was gonna say, that's not helpful at all. <laughs> no, and, and this comes back into Google Slides, alt text does not let you mark it as decorative. Yeah. And so it shouldn't have alt text, um, but I can't tell it not to have alt text. Other checks, I like that a, one. Yeah, whatever that means. <laughs> if it doesn't explain it anymore, that's not helpful. So it's kind of a checkbox accessibility checker. It doesn't really do anything. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of sad. Thank you, Christy. Yeah, we are at the point where we're, I, I'm done presenting what I'm presenting and I'm, but I'm happy to sit, I'm happy to explore things with people and answer questions. So, because I think this has been an interesting conversation about accessibility. Yeah, thank you, Rebecca. I was just, I just mm -hmm. wanted to say that I think the best way out here is just trial and error. 
and to check with you know students who have accessibility issues if it's working with them or not. Like for example, Maha, when you mentioned uh, downloading Google Slides, I do agree with you. Some things are not accessible if you download it as a regular PowerPoint slide. I mean, regular PowerPoint presentation. But recently, when I um, I worked on a PowerPoint presentation and um, I was working with a visually impaired student, uh, he didn't he didn't seem to find Google Slides accessible nor the PDF version of it. So after working on the Google Slides, I downloaded it as a regular PowerPoint presentation, and then he had access to it. And not mm. all templates, for example, on SlidesGo are accessible. So after I actually worked on a SlidesGo template, I then used what uh, Rebecca was showing us now regarding the order and, uh, you know, what sit things to remove if there's yeah. extra line, for instance, or artwork or decoration. Yeah. Some things had to be removed for it to be more accessible. So it's, yeah, it's kind of a long process of trial and error. Yeah, that's useful. The other thing, so so the reason you downloaded into PowerPoint is not because just PowerPoint's more accessible, because you could also remove this, this stuff by noticing the order and all that, right? Because originally I used to tell you, so well, you, you learn how to download it. If I send you something in a format that you don't like, then just download it as Word or slides or whatever. That's not going to solve the pro all the problems, right? That's going to maybe fix a few problems, but there are a few things that you still need to tweak. Yes. So I guess the accessibility checker in this case, and the I mean, I didn't uh, know about the accessibility checker on the Google Slides, Rebecca. Like you just showed us now, I wasn't aware of that on Google Slides. I thought it was only on the regular PowerPoint thing. But uh, yes, I do agree that we have to. Again, after downloading the Google Slides or presentation to keep editing until it's fully accessible and then try it out with the student. <laughs> see, is it fine? Anything, any changes need to be made yeah. for it to be uh, more accessible and so on. I found a better accessibility checker. So this was called Grackle. Um, and it does tell you which thing is what. Um, so it does highlight which image is missing a tag. <laughs> that's useful <laughs> yeah. yeah awesome yeah it's just too bad it won't let you mark things as as oh it doesn't like the contrast in this one i wouldn't have thought so Make it the blue blue needs to be a little darker yeah I've worked with people who use yellow on white background and I still don't understand how they can see it. Hmm. I just, you know, uh, or or white on a yellow background. I know somebody yeah, who does that because yellow, it's in our really logo. It, it's in our logo. It's like the, the yellow is in our in the treehouse logo. And so I know somebody who uses it and I just keep have to tell her it's like, yeah, I, like how, how can you see that? Because I can't really see it, right? <laughs> It's like, no, use black on yellow background <laughs> and then you're fine, but yeah. Becky, folks were asking about the slides. So I'm guessing you're going to email them to everyone. Yeah, I'll email, yeah, I'll them. email them. Yeah. And you, yeah, great. Okay, thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Maha. Thank you, everyone. You're welcome. Let's thank stop you. recording. Yeah, that's a good idea. Bye-bye. Uh, that was me.